Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Susan and on behalf of the people of First Church, I welcome you as we worship of this day. We are beginning a three new small group book study groups called Love is the Way and would like to encourage and invite you all to participate. You can register uh, by uh, going to the website and choosing the class of your choice. You can also use your cell phone and in the text portion of your phone, simply put the church's phone number and there put events in the text message. And when you send that to the church, it will come up with the three different classes you can register for just simply on your phone by texting to the church 262-658-3213. Again, I welcome you as we come to worship and pray indeed that we might be touched by this message of love as we move into a new year and a new season. Good morning. My name is Pamela Garside Myers, and I am the Sunday School Superintendent here at First United Methodist Church and Chair of the Children and Family Ministries. And it is my joy to serve this morning as worship assistant. Uh, would you please join me in our opening prayer? God of love, you bless us with your presence wherever we are. Thank you for the gift of this community and the opportunity to witness your love in each other. Keep us strong in mind and spirit as we seek to understand your way of love. We beckon the spirit to reveal how you would have us show that love to each other today. Amen. Our first reading comes from 1 Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. 
But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. Our second reading comes from the letter to the Romans. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for you, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we are beginning a new worship series based on Bishop Michael Curry's new book, Love is the Way, Finding Hope in Troubled Times. And as I shared in the welcome, we are also beginning three new study groups that I hope that you will participate in and join and invite others to join with you. Maybe you have heard of Bishop Curry. He was one who was asked to preach at Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's wedding a few years ago, and he has been visible ever since. The cornerstone of his faith and ministry is living out love as scriptures teach us, and there seems to be no better thought for us to reflect on, no better thought to practice, no better thought that is more pertinent these days than love. Love is also at the cornerstone of our church's vision, that vision statement to build a diverse community with God's radical love. And so this very first week, we begin by taking a look what this thing of love is all about. What does love look like? Love looks like my Aunt June. When my mother died when I was 13, our extended family split. No longer was I able to uh, see the relatives on my mother's side. But that didn't stop my Aunt June from seeing us. When I would come home from school each day, there she would be sitting in her car, perhaps a block away from our house. She was always there if I wanted to stop to say hi or to talk, or just there to make sure that I had made it home safely and that I had looked okay. As time uh, went on, knew that Aunt June was a safe refuge when I needed a place to go. And she would, when I went off to college, write letters, send care packages, visit. Aunt June always took the initiative to reach out to care and to love me. That is what love looks like. Now many languages have a variety of words that they use to describe different aspects of love. And it is true for us biblically as well. The New Testament is written in Greek, and Greek has three different words they use to express different aspects of love. They have the word eros, which we often think of and where our word erotic comes from. It represents a physical and sexual love, it is a love that uh, is at the very center of our celebration of Valentine's Day. There is philia love, or that which is familiar or brotherly love. 
it is why the city of Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love. And finally, there is agape, which is love for the other. Sacrificial love that seeks the good and well-being of others, of society, and of the world. Unfortunately, there are times when we simply talk about love and muddle all three of those uh, together. But in these six weeks, as we take a look at this thing called love, we are going to take a look at agape love that is outward. And I suspect that you, like myself, have experienced agape love. I just want you to think about for a moment about someone who may have impacted your life, someone who stood by you, maybe somebody who pushed you, somebody who believed in you or sacrificed for you. And most likely they weren't doing it because it served them, but they were doing it because they cared about you. Bishop Curry gives us this definition of agape love. He says, love is a firm commitment to act for the well-being of someone other than yourself. It can be personal or political, individual or communal, intimate or public. What I didn't know as a teenager is that Aunt June's love was freely shared with others it wasn't simply just reserved for me. And not doing something grand never stopped her from being grand in the eyes of others, as she gave herself in the gifts of her lives to whomever was in need. There's a familiar passage in the New Testament that is often quoted. It comes from John 3:16, For God so loved the world, that God gave us God's only son. God so loved the world that God gave. God gave. God did not take. God gave. That's love. That's agape. That's the love that is giving the way to the heart of God and to each other. Now I have to admit that I have officiated at more weddings than uh, one might suspect. It is hard to believe that there are a number of weddings when in the five years I've been in ministry here in Kenosha, my first three weddings are coming up this spring and summer. But I've officiated at several hundred weddings. When I served Trinity United Methodist Church in downtown Denver, I was there for nine years and we would host 150 to 200 weddings a year. It was not uncommon to have six to nine weddings on a holiday weekend, such as Memorial Day or Labor Day. And when I would ask couples about what scripture readings they would like to have at their weddings, most of them were familiar with 1 Corinthians 13 and mentioned it either was a passage that they wanted read at their wedding or a passage that they didn't want read at their wedding because everybody used it. 1 Corinthians 13, of course, is Paul's famous writing on love, that which we read earlier. And some of those verses that were shared that Paul writes are these. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have all faith as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way or is irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And now faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Paul knows exactly what he is saying. And sometimes I think we get it mixed up. You see, Paul didn't have weddings or marital relationships in mind at all when he wrote these words. 
even though these words fit and are appropriate, but Paul wrote these words because he was so upset and angry with what was happening at the church in Corinth. Corinth in Asia Minor, today in Greece, was and still is a sea town. And what it meant is that Corinth was most likely the most diverse community and church that Paul established, as people all over would come to Corinth to trade. And so what began as a beautiful thing for Paul gave way in his absence to separation and fighting. Word got back that troubling aspects were happening at the church of Corinth. First, word got back to Paul that people were not united and worshiping the one true God. You see, people coming from all over the world had gone back to the inclusion of idols or the practices that they had known, to the teachings from others that made sense and tried to combine it all with this Christian faith or way of Jesus. Second of all, they were excluding people from the Lord's Supper. In the early church, the Lord's Supper followed the pattern of the New Testament, whereby there was a meal that was shared, and it was in the middle of the meal that the cup and the bread were lifted up. Only during this meal, people were choosing who they wanted to be part of it, and clearly excluding others. People were excluded because of their social standing. People were excluded because they weren't liked. People were excluded because of their race and ethnicity. People were excluded because of their education or lack of education. People were excluded because of their physical disabilities. The Lord's Supper, the church, meant to be open to all, had been fracturing into different camps of who was in and who was out. And lastly, people came from all different places to Corinth. They had different understandings, different ways of doing things. And instead of embracing the differences of others, they were used for arguments and for dis divisive behaviors. They forgot completely what bound them together. They forgot that they had this common life in Jesus. And so when this word got back to Paul, he was truly beside himself and angry when he heard all of these things. And he knew that the only thing that could change such a deep mess was love. A love for neighbor, a love that was a gift of self to another. Love was the only thing left that Paul knew to save the community. Now, some believe that the opposite of love is hate, but I believe that the opposite of love is selfishness. It is a life that is completely centered on the self. And I don't know about you, but after this week, there seems to be nothing more pertinent than coming back to agape love. There is nothing that will heal the deep divisions, pain, and hurt than the love of God through us. I don't know about you, but I have been glued to the TV and to the computer. First this week, listening to the words of our district attorney, Michael Gravely, in the shooting of Jacob Blake, and second to the violence at our Capitol building in our country's capital. The first, the Jacob Blake press conference, after a summer of turmoil and unrest. And while I want to first say that I have great respect for our DA, I have found District Attorney Gravely to be a tireless, compassionate man who works hard at being fair and has worked hard to bring changes needed to make our systems fairer. And I wasn't surprised by the decisions as I have uh, been learning about what our law says. 
but at the same time that this press conference is going on. Charges were also being read for Kyle Rittenhouse, who at the time was 17, with a machine gun killing two people, almost three, pictures of him standing just two blocks from our church, and people thinking that it was and is okay. I am stunned and overwhelmed. And what I hope and pray for as a people of faith going forward is the passion that was demonstrated this summer for racial justice will not stop. That we will find a way that violence as a way to having voices heard will come to an end. You see, at the heart of those who were truly protesting and not causing chaos and violence to others and destruction of property was a cry for something more, for wrongs in our society to be righted. And I truly believe that the inequities and the barriers that have been erected in this country for people of color need significant change. If nothing else, this pandemic has pulled back the curtains to bring light if we have not seen that. Race has divided us and opportunities and the fullness of life for far too long. It has not allowed us to garner the richness the diversity of race can bring to our lives and society. This past week has also shown us how divided we are as a country, how acceptable violence is a way to get what we want, how we find ways to justify violence, how we are willing to crush the very institutions that have been at the heart and center of all that we believe as a people who live in the United States. It has demonstrated how much we have lost faith or trust in leaderships and systems, whether they be political or governmental, science or news reporting. Many historians, historians have been commenting these past days by the brilliance of our founding fathers and what they have written and laid out for us, even if they were not perfect themselves, but they sought a path to a better life. Ultimately, the circumstances we find ourselves in sound a lot like ancient Corinth and the people whom Paul addressed. Unfortunately, the circumstances that we find ourselves come down to the very opposite of love, that of selfishness. Selfishness mirrored in the ways of the Corinthian community who wanted Jesus on their own terms with their own kind and having their own way and only with those who believe the same. As Paul sought to address the community about agape of love that was not perfect, but he spoke of it as an overriding value to embrace and to empower us, to guide us. That Paul spoke that there is something greater beyond ourselves and abilities that will be able to lead us to a place where God wants us, and that is love. The love that we have for another, that we share and show, maybe because we don't feel something, but because we know of the love that God has for us. And so in these myths, of these large issues that face us today as individuals, as our community, as our society, as our country. I often hear people wanting to just throw up their hands saying, it's too big, there is nothing I can do. But I would suggest that that's not true. The first is, you can work at growing your heart to include God to include others, 
to ground yourself. Bishop Curry speaks of love as the rules of life. And what he means by that is to practice love so that it is something that supports us and guides us that we create tangible habits that support our heart's intention of life. Bishop Curry did not think of this all on his own. It comes from St. Benedict and the Benedictine rule of life that has indeed guided and supported the Benedictine community for over 15 centuries. It was a way in which they sought to balance work and prayer. And so next week, I will outline a few questions for you to help you establish your rule of life, of how your desire to grow closer to God who is love, and to create your truest, most loving self, so that you are able to open yourself and to love others, even though they may be different than you or believe differently than you. And secondly, I think of my Aunt June. She was never an activist. I don't know if she ever wrote one letter to a congressperson or a senator. But everything she tried to do was to love others. Wherever there was a need that she might bring her faith and share a small portion of herself with another, she was there. And so I invite you to think about what are those small steps that you can respond to. Is it by having a conversation with someone who is different from you? Is it caring on a neighbor who may need groceries? Is it bringing items to the Love in Action hygiene drive? Is it writing a letter to a senator or a congressperson? Is it paying attention to someone that you need to write a letter to or communicate by phone or social media to in another place of the country or of the world to be able to connect and know that they are not alone. What small thing of love can you commit to, to doing for another? What is it that we call this love thing again? Love is a firm commitment to act for the well-being of someone other than yourself. May it be so. Amen. Now let us enter into a time of prayer, beginning with the prayers that you have requested. We pray for peace and reconciliation in Kenosha for patience and perseverance as we deal with the demands of winter, and for comfort for all those battling illness, and that our heavy concerns will be made lighter. Would you please join me in our breakthrough prayer? God, let your love light the path you would have us travel. Empower us and grant us the courage to include all people in the work you would have us do. Amen. Let us continue in a time of silent prayer. Gracious and loving God, a week ago we entered 2021 filled with hope and promise of a new year, and we still hold on to that hope and promise through you and your son Jesus Christ, despite the events of this first full week of 2021. First, we give thanks for this opportunity to worship you, and though we would rather be together in our chapel or sanctuary, lifting our collective voices and praise through song and prayer, we hold on to the promise that with wisdom that keeps us safe and healthy and with new vaccines beginning to be administered, 
we are getting closer and closer to that time when we will celebrate together again with more joy than we can imagine. Until that day, we know there is work for us to do, and we ask your wisdom and strength as we continue to do what is needed to keep one another safe from the coronavirus. We ask for your healing for all those who continue to be affected by the virus, whether through illness, loss of loved ones, loss of jobs, loss of companionship that leads to loneliness, or loss of trust in others to keep them safe. For healthcare workers who care for their patients, continue to strengthen them in this trying time. As the school year continues, do all you can to empower and strengthen our teachers and students as they continue to safely navigate this unusual school year from their homes. We give you continued thanks for our own Sunday school teachers and their creativity as they continue to share their love of you, Lord, and your son, Jesus Christ, with the children and youth of our church every Sunday morning on Zoom. We give you thanks for the ways you have broken through in the life of our church as we continue to be your church with purpose in our current reality. We give you thanks for your love and for the love you have shared with us so that we can put it into action as we seek to care for each other and our community, whether through sharing our resources, through donations of food and hygiene items, calling on one another and sending cards, continuing to meet in classes and book studies and other small groups and committees on Zoom, or just holding one another in prayer. We continue to be committed to being a church that manifests your love for us, through our ministries and missions with each other and to our community. And we pray that you continue to break through in the life of our church and help us recognize and feel your spirit empowering us and granting us that courage to be about the work you would have us do. And finally, in the midst of events in our own city of Kenosha and at our U.S. Capitol, we also seek your loving mercies for us, for our community, our country, and our world. We pray for your love to be known through healing in our community and for peace, unity, and wisdom that brings about justice for the most vulnerable. Empower us and give us the courage to be part of that healing in Kenosha. We pray the same for our country as we move through a divisive transition and a new administration. May your wisdom be with our leadership on both sides of the aisle to work together to bring us through, not just through political transitions, but through this pandemic and unify us as a country to work towards your hopes and dreams for us for the sake of all citizens and residents within our borders and for the world that looks to us for leadership. We pray all this and so much more in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we transition to our time of offering, uh, there are three ways um, that you can share your offering with the church. First, you can give electronically on the church website by choosing give in the main menu and following the directions. You can mail your check directly to the church or you can bring your offering to our next Love in Action on January 17th between 10 a.m. and noon.
One of my favorite biblical passages comes from Paul's writing to the Romans, where he says that nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as you go forth this day and into the week, may you know that no matter what your circumstances, that the love of God is always with you through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.